Hi, my dear lovely friends. Uh, very, very warm welcome to this uh, session of surgery recall for the questions which were asked on 20th of January 2023 in your FMG exam. Uh, my dear lovely friends, this uh, recall is based on uh, whatever uh, uh, feedbacks we got after the exam. And uh, uh, let us uh, first try to see how was the question paper actually. So if I just try to dissect this question paper, uh, this I feel, uh, first, this is my personal opinion, that paper one, yes, paper one uh, was a little towards the easier side, I would say. And uh, probably the examiners would have thought that the student should be able to score somewhere around 90 to maybe 100 marks. This I am talking about uh, the average scoring. And uh, because the paper one was uh, probably towards the easier side, so definitely the paper two was towards the tougher side, especially the clinical subjects, the medicine surgery, I would say they were a little towards the tougher side and a few questions from other clinical subjects as well. That means uh, what the examiners would have thought that probably for cracking the exam, if they believe that 50% is what the average student has to score. So in paper two, the requirement was 50 to 60 uh, as far as the average scoring is concerned. Surgery per se, yes, it was uh, on the tougher side and uh, uh, I have tried to summarize a few questions which are approximately 40 questions. So uh, in these 40 questions, my personal opinion, this is my individual opinion, that 15 to 16 questions were uh, doable easily, which majority of the students would have definitely done. Uh, however, a little um, going towards the more intelligent side or uh, maybe towards the higher side with a wonderful preparation, the students would have been able to manage 24 to 25 questions. So this is my personal opinion regarding this surgery uh, question paper. Overall, if we take a look at 300 questions, then I believe that yes, uh, many students would have been able to cross uh, much beyond the line in paper one. And uh, paper two, definitely it was on the tougher side. So uh, there would be a, a scoring of around say 45% to 55% in paper two. What, or you can say 40% to 55% in paper two. So overall looking at this 300 questions, the pass percentage for this exam with my individual experience in the past should be somewhere around 17% to 23%, right? <clears throat> with this brief dissection of this FMG paper, uh, if we just try to take a look at the surgery recall questions, the distribution of surgery questions, uh, I would first like to tell you better that uh, uh, the questions which are summarized here, there are approximately uh, seven questions from trauma section. Uh, from vascular, there are approximately three questions. From endocrine without malignancies, there is one question. From pediatric surgery, there are, there are approximately five questions. So, uh, adult surgery, there are approximately 12 questions and onco surgery, uh, which was actually the belief for uh, the belief of the examiners, uh, because not only in surgery, but even in OBG, ENT, they've been focusing on the malignancies. And uh, miscellaneous, I have included three questions here. So if we just try to take a look, 7 and 3, 10, 11, 11, 5, 16, 16 plus 12, 28, 38 and 41 questions is what is distributed in this. However, the important thing to note here is the oncosurgery story because here the examiners have focused a lot. So this was a surprise element here. There were few more surprises in this question paper, like trauma. We have been talking about that there should be questions from uh, Glasgow coma scale, from pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, from uh, blunt abdominal traumas, from penetrating abdominal traumas. But unfortunately, we did not find a question from these areas, which was a surprise element as far as surgery is concerned. At the same time, uh, instead of focusing on these pneumothorax or uh, other areas, the examiner focused more on the shock area. So there were quite a few questions from the uh, shock. 
Right. So let us just try to discuss first the trauma section. We will be going in this particular sequence only. Uh, this was a simple question, I guess. Uh, uh, this was a simple question, I guess. In pediatric age group, as per ATLS guidelines, which of the following is not included in A, B, C, D. This was a previous year question. A for securing the airway, B for breathing, C for circulation, D for dehydration. And my dear lovely friends, we know it is a D for disability and not dehydration. So the correct answer was D for dehydration. This is what we are supposed to exclude. Another question, which was actually a pediatric question. A child who is having malnutrition for a long period has presented in the emergency in a state of shock. Now, which of the following fluid is preferred initially in this baby? So definitely, yes, if somebody is having malnutrition for a longer period of time, then uh, uh, ringolectate and dextrose. This would be the best combination. Just give me a moment. Just give me a moment. Right, Bita. So, uh, in chronic malnutrition, uh, uh, presenting with the shock, the correct answer should be ringolectate and 5% dextrose. Right. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, most common feature in shock overall, in all types of shock, Bita. So, what we know is that the, the definition of shock per se is uh, decreased tissue oxygenation and perfusion. So whether it is uh, a cardiogenic shock or a hypovolemic shock or any other type of shock, the most important criteria here should have been hypoperfusion of tissues, which was actually the correct answer as well. Right, so not the increased pulse rate or raised BP or increased respiratory rate, it was hypoperfusion of tissues. Right, another question. Now, but I would like to draw your attention here that uh, uh, there was a clinical story which was put here that uh, a patient uh, who has suffered a motorbike accident, uh, uh, a road traffic accident type of story, he presented to the emergency in a state of shock. Uh, this was the initial story. And uh, then they started, as, then they asked urine output start reducing in which type of shock. The word start reducing is important. So, uh, my dear lovely friends, uh, if I uh, just take you Chanchal, uh, I would just like to draw your attention to the recent uh, edition of Billy and Love, which has come uh, very, very soon, the 28th edition of Bailey and Love. This is a from the 28th edition. Now, just to have a look here. According to the 28th edition of Bailey and Love, uh, this is page number, I guess it is uh, 14, yeah. Right, so herein, what they have done is a mild, moderate and severe. These are the three varieties of shock which they have given. In the older edition of Bailey and Love, that is 27th edition, they used mild, compensated, moderate and severe shock like that. But now here, mild has been included in the compensated and moderate severe in the un uncompensated shock. Please look carefully in this table, Bita. If you look here, the urine output is normal in mild. It is reduced in moderate and in severe, the patient almost goes into anuria. If the examiner has picked a question from this table, right then the correct answer for this question should have been reduced that means moderate but unfortunately in the same Bailey and Love 
just on the previous page they have given something mild compensated shock where they have given the stories like uh, initially there is tachycardia tachypnea mild reduction in urine output so this is where i want to draw your attention beta they have given here mild reduction in urine output here okay so if there is mild reduction in urine output in the mild type of shock then the answer for this question will be mild shock basically if suppose we don't know about what Bailey and Love has written what my understanding says that shock is simply hypoperfusion of tissues that means whenever there is hypoperfusion of tissues that means the uh, supply to the different organs is not proper so if we just try to apply this basic concept ki suppose boss there is a shock uh, the patient is just going into shock that means the supply to different organs including the kidney is decreasing and if the supply to the kidney is decreasing obviously the urine output will also start decreasing so if we look at the definition of shock that is hypoperfusion of tissues if there is less uh, uh, vascular supply to the kidneys the urine output is definitely going to decrease so from my side if the question is something like start reducing start reducing then from my side the better answer would be a mild shock so here i am just trying to draw your attention to the contradictory statement in the Bailey and Love itself, whether it is the 27th edition or the 28th edition, this is what we are seeing is the recent 28th edition of Bailey and Love. Here they say mild reduction in urine output in the mild shock itself. Right, Beta? Yes. So my answer to this particular question would be mild shock. Okay. Now there was a question related to QSOFA score. Uh, QSOFA actually is when the respiratory rate is more than 22 per minute, the systolic blood pressure less than 100 millimeter of mercury and GCS less than 15. That means this is there in QSOFA, the B and C are also there. So whatever was the last option, whether it was related to lactate dehydrogenase or urine output, that would be the correct answer. QSOFA does not include any other thing except respiratory rate more than 22, systolic BP less than 100 and altered mental status or uh, GCS less than 15, right? So the fourth option would have been the right answer for this question, right beta. Now another question, this was an image based question and I'm really proud all the students as they know that this is the first ever image based question asked in the history of FMG exam in the year 2015 and since then it has been repeated three times in the FMG exam. So just looking at this biconvex shadow, all of you would have answered this uh, question correctly. Yes. So. Uh, before we uh, jump on to the question, let us look at the options. The options were also clearly simple. EDH, SDH, intracerebral hematoma and scalp hematomas. Uh, and uh, majority of you would not even have looked at all the four options. This is what I personally believe. Um, the question says 34 year old person was rushed to the emergency after a road traffic accident. The patient was unconscious on arrival and after some time the patient regained his consciousness. A plain CT was done where the image is given below and all of you have marked this answer correctly. This is a hyperdense biconvex shadow classical of extra dural hematoma. Right beta. So I am pretty sure that you would not have committed any silly mistake out here in this particular question. Okay. Now, another question here, uh, wherein a patient was brought to the emergency after a road traffic accident, skin grafting was done, where the graft was taken from the same person. So, beta, they have given this in the question, the graft was taken from the same person. And there was an image, though it was a little more red in color over the forearm area. Uh, this the options were quite simple a graft is taken from the same person so you all know the answer beta and i hope you would not have committed any silly mistake in this particular question the answer is autograft same person auto identical twins iso same species lo and different species xenograft right another question here 
now this particular question i would say better that uh, this uh, looks to be a gangrene of the toes and here uh, i have got few apprehensions that as soon as you would have seen the image the first thought which would have come to your mind is the answer goes in favor of burgess disease right now i have a question here if the age of the patient was given as 73 years then the answer goes in favor of atherosclerosis but if this age was not mentioned in the question or if the age would have been mentioned anything below 45 years then the answer for this question goes in favor of burgess disease right so or there, there is a possibility that atherosclerosis would not have been in the option itself right then your answer is definitely going to be burgess disease because uh, we know that you all have been trained uh, like anything to see the image of burgess and you immediately mark the answer right so please please be careful that if suppose it was a 73 year old then the answer uh, would have been atherosclerosis but if there was nothing like uh, uh, 73 years then the answer would have been burgess whether atherosclerosis was there in the option or not this is also has to be seen but if this was the framing of the question and these were the given options then the correct answer for this goes in favor of atherosclerosis right beta so uh, this this might have been uh, a silly mistake if uh, this was the particular framing of the question now, which of the following is least commonly used as a graft in coronary artery bypass grafting? So, beta, the long-term patency is obtained with the left internal memory artery. Uh, commonly, we are using the long stiffness vein. The radial artery is also commonly used. But intercostal artery, this is a small caliber vessel. So, this will not be able to uh, uh, adapt to those pressures required for the supply to the heart. So, intercostal artery would be the least uh, commonly used option for CABG. Right. Very good, David. Uh, great. Chanchal. Good. Sumit, very good. Now, gold standard treatment for varicose veins should be, uh, according to the uh, 28th edition of Billy and Love, the answer goes in favor of endothermal ablation. We can do the radio frequency ablation, we can do the laser ablation for these varicose veins, which are now preferred as the gold standard treatment. So, ligation and stripping. Uh, that holds the back seat and steps. So, this, what you're seeing, this is done for perforator incompetence beta right so endothermal ablation would be the correct answer for gold standard treatment for varicose veins another question which of the following is the main risk factor for acute mastitis now mastitis beta we know that it is inflammation of the breast more commonly seen during pregnancy and lactation especially at the time of lactation when the mother is giving a feed to the baby then sometimes what can happen beta you know in the areola there are uh, sebaceous glands there is hypertrophy of sebaceous glands, Montgomery tubercles, which serve to lubricate the nipple and keep the nipple moist and does not allow the cracks in the nipple to form. But if by chance the Montgomery tubercles are not able to produce sufficient sebum to lubricate the nipple and this lady, if she is not using external lubricating agents, then the dryness in the nipple persists, cracks develop in the nipple. And now when the baby takes the feed, then MCQ from the baby's mouth, the staph aureus from the baby's mouth passes through cracks in the mother's nipple and go inside the mother's breast, which is fully engorged with milk. And there the staph party starts. So out of these given options, the best answer, what is the main risk factor would be the cracks in the nipple. Engorgement is also a risk factor, but yes, a better answer out of the two would be cracks in the nipple. Right. Now, we move towards the pediatric surgery, and there was an image-based question. Uh, this uh, is actually uh, the anatomy question, to be honest, uh, and has been discussed by anatomy ma'am from MIST. Here, what you are able to see is a unilateral cleft lip on the left side, 
and they simply asked what is the reason for this uh, cleft lip. This is our previous year question and I hope none of you would have committed a silly mistake in this particular question as well. This is due to failure of fusion of median nasal process and the maxillary process. Right, the cleft palate is due to failure of fusion of the two palatine shelves. Good. Right. Now, another question, Bita. There was a patient presenting with a swelling on the anterior border of sternomastoid muscle in the lower part of the neck. This swelling represents the remnant of which of the following branchial clefts? So, basically, on the anterior border of sternomastoid muscle, we talk about a branchial cyst which is usually situated in the upper or middle part of the neck and a branchial fistula which is situated in the lower part of the neck. So fistula would just be an opening in the skin and cyst would be a swelling. So here he's talking about a branchial cyst and we all know whether it's a branchial cyst or a branchial fistula. Yes, my dear lovely friends, very good Basit, perfect beta. Thank you so much. You have really done well and the correct answer would be B. Right. So I hope you would not have committed a mistake out there. Great. Then another image based question wherein there was some uh, coiling of the tube seen in the upper esophagus. There was a gas uh, seen inside the stomach as well. And uh, in the question they said that a newborn baby on second day of life was found to have continuous frothing of saliva from the mouth presented in the emergency identify the pathology we know this is the classical presentation of esophageal atresia and uh, in the given options we know that uh, if the upper esophagus is blind the nasogastric tube will not be able to go down there will be coiling here and if the lower esophagus is connected to the trachea then the tracheal air will be going into the lower esophagus and the stomach will be distended with gas so that will be a tracheoesophageal fistula so uh, perfect beta very good, wonderful, Sakshi, uh, Dili Prakash, Elahi, uh, Chanchal, Basit, David, Sakshi, Vita, wonderful. Great, so the answer is tracheoesophageal fistula for this question. Okay, now which of the following is not true about infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis? Again, I would say that this is an overlapping question from pediatrics, wherein uh, in the given options, uh, you have to tell what is incorrect. So you all know uh, that in hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, we are talking about the pylorus wherein the main role is of the circular muscle fibers. So there is hypertrophy of the circular muscle fibers. Ultrasound of the abdomen is 100% sensitive modality to detect this pathology. Now here there was a catch, 100% sensitive. Uh, we generally you do not use these words 100% sensitive but we know that yes ultrasound is actually the imaging modality of choice so uh, it is really difficult to choose whether it is 100% sensitive or not that means uh, both A and B can be the answer for this question now projectile non bilious vomiting yes in pyloric stenosis there will be projectile non bilious vomiting and there would be dehydration with metabolic alkalosis because of loss of acid from the stomach that means now if we consider these two answers out of these two I feel this is the best answer because it is not the longitudinal muscle fibers but the circular muscle fibers which are more often affected in this hypertrophic pyloric stenosis right so the answer for this question should be hypertrophy of the longitudinal muscle fibers this is a false statement another image based question and my dear lovely friends I'm pretty sure that again you would have uh, not committed a mistake in identifying this pathology you can see um, this is fusion of the two kidneys so this should be a horseshoe kidney let us just take a look a patient presented in the OPD with hematuria he has been suffering from recurrent episodes of UTI identify the pathology whether it's a polycystic kidney horseshoe hypernephrom or a pancake kidney so uh, yes Peter what answer would you have marked for this Very good. So Chanchal, Dili Prakash, Baset, Amritansh, Saurav, wonderful. You have done really good. So the correct answer for this would be a horseshoe kidney. Right. Now, this question, uh, this question definitely uh, is not so uh, frequently asked, but uh, they 
try to know that what is actually the culprit behind the lower esophageal sphincter if we talk about ecclesia cardia type of stories. Which of the following is true about increased tone of lower esophageal sphincter? There might be some uh, uh, of different framing in, the, in this particular given question. Uh, absence of meesness nerve plexus in the esophagus. If we talk about ecclesia cardia, it is the absence of uh, ganglion cells in the orbic plexus or the motor nerve plexus. Increased acetylcholine receptor action on LES. So, beta acetylcholine tries to constrict the lower esophageal sphincter, what we see in ecclesia cardia. Response of LES to excess nicotine or nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide causes relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. And here he is talking about increased tone of LES. Depending on what was the actual framing of this question in the exam, which we are not able to recall nicely, if they asked that increased tone of LES, then increase the style colony receptors if this was in the option this is going to be the correct answer but if suppose in the question there instead of increase this was decreased and instead of excess nicotine there was less activity of nicotine or nitrous oxide then the answer will become this okay so if it was increase the colony receptor section on LES this will increase the tone of LES. But if B option was decrease the acetylcholine receptors and the C option was a less nitrous oxide or nicotine effect, then that would be the answer, right? Okay. Very good. So if this framing of the question was correct, then the answer for this question would be increase the acetylcholine receptor action on LES. Okay. Another question, the surgeon is doing, again, this is an anatomy overlap question. The surgeon is doing a upper GI endoscopy. He has crossed the cricopharyngeal sphincter. He saw another indentation in the esophagus after crossing the cricopharyngeal sphincter. This is related to which of the following? So, according to Bailey and Love, there are three constrictions in the esophagus at a distance of 15, 25 and 40 centimeters from the central upper incisor. The first one at 15 centimeters is the cricopharyngeus. The second one at 25 centimeters is the arch of aorta and division of bronchus. And the third one at 40 centimeters is the diaphragmatic constriction. So after crossing the cricopharyngeal sphincter in the esophagus, the surgeon is going to find this arch of aortic constriction. Very good, beta. Wonderful. Basit, Spirit, Rakesh. Good. God bless you all, Vita. Chanchal, 25 centimeters would have been given in the question, probably because I was going through the anatomy recall as well. Fine. Now, another question, Vita, image based question. Uh, we were able to see a coin uh, which on this uh, view, uh, the PA view, looks uh, uh, a circular, a flat shadow, and on a lateral view, it looks a linear shadow. So, as you all know better, that this should be a foreign body in the esophagus and not the trachea. If it would have been in the trachea, the view, the shadow would have been just the opposite. In trachea, it would have been linear on this view and a flat shadow would have been seen on this lateral view. Right? So, this foreign body is in the esophagus. Now, looking at these images, uh, this foreign body is actually stuck up near the cricopharynx. So, if it is stuck up near the cricopharynx, I would say that uh, according to Bailey and Love, they do not mention about Hemlick maneuver. For these esophageal foreign bodies, they simply write endoscopic removal. Now, if it is an esophageal foreign body, no tracheostomy, no laryngoscopy or bronchoscopy type of story, we will do an esophagoscopic retrieval for this. Or even if in one of the options there was some... Um, okay. Uh, so, Adil Rashid Bitta, if uh, there was decreased nitric oxide in that particular question, then yes, the answer would be going in that favor. Right. Okay. So, here the answer would be esophagoscopic retrieval, right? Not the Hemlick's maneuver. Trachial foreign bodies, as we learn in ENT, that yes, the laryngeal foreign bodies, we do this Hemlick's maneuver. Then there was another image uh, based question here in they gave the stories of the stomach. 
the pylorus area, then there was a pyloric sphincter area, and then there was the first part of deuteronomy, then the second part of deuteronomy, and as per the information what I have, they marked the arrow on uh, this uh, first part of deuteronomy here, right? So, if the arrow was marked on this area, the answer is first part of deuteronomy. If the arrow was marked on this area, then the answer would have been the pylorus. Okay, so as per the information what I have, uh, the arrow was marked at the first part of duodenum, and uh, uh, for coin in the esophagus, uh, okay, beta, that you are saying there was an option. Suppose I say the option here was wait and watch. Now, what should be done? In the question, they have not mentioned uh, that uh, uh, there is any symptom or something. But on the X-ray, we are able to see that the coin is stuck up near the cricopharynx. It has not negotiated the cricopharyngeal sphincter. So, if the coin has not negotiated the cricopharyngeal sphincter, then we need to do the endoscopic retrieval if it is lying just right there. Okay. Otherwise, wait and watch would have been a policy that if the baby has swallowed the coin and the coin would have gone down, maybe in the stomach or something, then there is no point of doing this endoscopic retrieval. We would have waited and watched for maybe one day, two days or three days, the coin would have come out spontaneously. Right. Okay, uh, Spirit Bita, uh, the marking for this question, as you mentioned, is correct. So, most likely it should have been the first part of duodenum. Right, now going with another question, an adult male with uh, presented with symptoms of duodenal ulcer, maximum chances of recurrence with minimal morbidity, maximum chances of recurrence with minimal morbidity is seen after which procedure? So in this particular question, beta, if I say that uh, suppose this is the stomach here and uh, these are the vagal fibers suppose which are distributed we you know there is a vagal trunk here there are secretory fibers which are going and supplying the fundus and the body area these are actually the nerves of grassy and then there are motor fibers coming out which are uh, going towards the antrum and the pylorus area the nerves of lethargic which are responsible for motility of the stomach. Now, if you look at the surgical treatment for duodenal ulcer, earlier what the doctors were doing or the surgeons were doing, they were chopping the vagus nerve at this level. That was a truncal vagotomy. Now, whenever truncal vagotomy was done, then yes, the uh, acid secretion was nicely controlled. But the problem was because the motor fibers were denervated, so the stomach motility slowed down. That is uh, why whenever truncal vagotomy was done, we had to do a drainage operation. We had to either connect the stomach with the jejunum gastrojejunostomy or we had to relax the pylorus by pyloroplasty so that after a truncal vagotomy, if these fibers, motor fibers are also gone, if there is decreased motility in the stomach, then whatever food comes in the stomach, that should pass down. But yes, truncal vagotomy is taking care of all the fibers of the vagus, so the acid control was good, the chances of recurrence was less. But now what we are doing, beta, because we don't want to do a drainage operation, so gradually the surgeon started becoming selective and now it is a highly selective or a parietal cell vagotomy where we just denervate those vagal fibers which are going to the parietal cells. That means in highly selective vagotomy, we might be missing out on vagotomy for some of the vagal fibers which are supplying the parietal cells. That means some amount of acid would still be produced, which might lead to recurrence of duodenal ulcers, right? So, the maximum chances of recurrence with minimal morbidity, if we say, should be with the highly selective vagotomy. This is the drawback of highly selective vagotomy. Okay, so uh, the answer for this should be highly selective vagotomy. Right. 
uh, Lalit is saying that uh, in question number seven, the history was so the graft is taken from the twins. But if the graft is taken from the twins, then the answer will become isograft, right? But if it is taken from the same person, because uh, with the information which I have received from some of the students, they said it was taken from the same person. So if it is taken from the same person, the answer was autograft. Okay, fine. Now this end of the question here, wherein a chronic alcoholic presented in the emergency with sudden onset of her upper abdominal pain radiating to the back with anorexia, nausea and occasional vomiting, serum amylase was raised in this particular question. So clear, clear cut story that upper abdominal pain radiating to the back, generally acute pancreatitis this upper abdominal pain radiating to the back is aggravated in lying down position, relieved on sitting and bending forwards. So the clear cut story, I believe that all of you would have marked the answer right, absolutely. And the answer was acute pancreatitis. Okay, fine beta. Now, another question here. Treatment for the pathology shown in the image given below. Now herein, depending on what was the image in the question okay the answer will change i'll just try to guide you that the information which i have received was there were some stones in the kidney there were some stones in the ureter okay the treatment of choice for kidney stones and the upper and middle ureteric stones upper and middle ureteric stones, the treatment of choice is ESWL. For lower ureteric stones, the treatment of choice is URS. If there is more than 1.5 centimeter stone in the kidney, or it's a cysteine stone, or pregnancy, or bleeding disorders, uh, or any distal obstruction, then we are doing a PCNL, right? So, if he was simply asking what is the treatment of choice for the kidney stone, upper and middle ureteric stone. The answer is ESWL. If he, there was a stone shadow in the lower ureter, then the answer is URS. Now what is upper, what is middle and what is lower ureter? So beta, whatever you are seeing from this area to the pelvic inlet, this area is the upper ureter. Okay. That area which lies within the pelvic bone area, this is the middle ureter. And that area which lies just beneath this bone shadow down up to the bladder, this is the lower ureter. So if there was a, a hyperdense shadow here uh, in the lower ureter, the answer will be URS. But if there was a hyperdense shadow above, then the answer would be ESWL. Okay. Uh, the beta, I don't think we will be doing a conservative management because uh, these they did not mention the size of the stone or anything. Right, so as we can see here itself beta, Adil uh, is saying middle ureter, Basit is saying upper ureter. So uh, I would just like to remind you beta, just for the information that from here to the starting of the pelvic bone, this is the upper ureter. If we talk about the pelvic bone area, this is the middle ureter and beneath the pelvic bone shadow here, right up to the bladder, this is the lower ureter. So depending on where the shadow was, the answer will change accordingly, right? So for me, if I see this particular image, my answer is ESWL, right? Now, which of the following is least likely to cause bilateral hydronephrosis? Uh, this is uh, something which uh, some of you have got confused that what the examiner is actually trying to ask. Mm, but anyways, doesn't matter better that even if you have marked the answer wrong, because we do understand a different state of mind at that particular point of time. If I say better that this is the story here, the concept, what we were supposed to apply here, he is asking bilateral hydronephrosis. Bilateral means both sides. Now, if he, he if he is asking the story of bilateral hydronephrosis, 
that means we should know that if there is any traffic jam which is distal to the opening of the two ureters that means if there is a traffic jam in this particular area whether it is here 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 or maybe here this traffic jam is going to create an impact on both the kidneys and will cause bilateral hydronephrosis but beta g if there is a traffic jam above this point to this point that means if there is any traffic jam in the pinky pinky area then it is not going to cause bilateral then it is going to cause only unilateral hydronephrosis now phimosis is something that uh, wherein we know that there is a traffic jam uh, at the opening of the external urethral opening right so here at this particular area there can be a traffic jam many of you have marked the answer as phimosis for this particular question beta but unfortunately i would say that in phimosis when we are not able to retract the prepuce beyond the glands it can create a traffic jam situation you know that uh, uh, the secretions will remain trapped there which carries the risk of cancer also poor hygiene is the commonest reason for penile cancers right that is why for pathological phimosis we do a circumcision now posterior urethral valves beta they are located in the prostatic urethra just distal to vero montanum can lead to a traffic jam which will cause bilateral hydronephrosis a stricture in the urethra Uh, a stricture in the urethra is again definitely going to cause a bilateral hydronephrosis a retrocaval ureter to beta yahan pe jo apne ko dimag lagana tha wo ye tha ki retrocaval means what cava is inferior vena cava so sometimes what happens beta inferior vena cava we know is situated slightly on to the right side so if the right ureter is passing behind the inferior vena cava sometimes the inferior vena cava may put pressure on the ureter so the right ureter may be pressed here and if there is pressing of the right ureter it will cause right hydronephrosis and not the left hydronephrosis so that is how uh, we we were actually supposed to approach this particular question koi baat nahi beta agar apne phimosis mark kiya hai as i told you beta this surgery question paper was not a cake walk paper let me be honest and admit it it was not a cake walk surgery paper right uh, i believe that 40% of the questions from surgery they were yes very much doable as we were able to see but 60% of the questions out of which i would say there was a controversy in bailey and love itself related to urine output start decreasing in which type of shock so these are few controversial questions also coming up so i hope the nb should um, the um, bodies should take care uh, of these yeah right so the answer for this question is a retrocaval ureter right management for a patient presenting with symptoms of bph in the early stages so in the initial stages of bph when the patient is only having mild symptoms we go ahead with the medical treatment and the medical treatment of choice we know are the selective alpha 1 blockers like the tamsulosin alfazosin um we can also use 5 alpha reductase inhibitors which reduces the size of the prostate but because bph patients their main concern is the urine flow the most troublesome symptom of bph is poor flow so as a doctor we want to increase the urine flow and because we use selective alpha 1 blockers which relax the prostatic urethra the urine flow increases and that is why tamsulosin is the preferred treatment of choice turp is indicated when there are severe symptoms or some complications of bph maybe retention of urine recurrent uti stones in the bladder or in the kidneys the post void residual urine becoming more than 100 ml or uh, maybe a bilateral hydronephrosis uremia type of story so if there are complications of bph then we cannot wait for the medicines 
to uh, uh, give us the solution because medicines will take long long time to relieve the problem and there in severe symptoms or complications with BPH we do TURP but for early stages we go ahead with the medical treatment the medical treatment of choice yes Peter. Uh, right Adil Bitu uh, TURP is a surgery for BPH for prostate cancer we are doing a radical prostatectomy right Peter? now there was another question related to hernia a young male present with the swelling in the inguinal region as shown in the image here so here we were able to see some swelling the image was a little different uh, in the exam uh, patient did not have any discomfort or pain he presented for his concern about the swelling to the hospital the swelling is reducible and reappears when the patient is asked to cough which of the following will be the treatment in this patient so basically he has given us a clinical scenario about a inguinal hernia here and they are asking what should be the treatment for inguinal hernias and the treatment for inguinal hernias is hernioplasty simple hernia anywhere in the body whenever the inside story starts coming out हमें क्या करना है जो भी सामान बाहर आ रहा है उसको वापस अंदर भेज देना है और फिर ऐसा इंतजाम करना है कि दोबारा ये बाहर आने की गलती ना करे बेसिकली द कांसेप्ट इन द ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ हर्नियास इज व्हाटएवर इज कमिंग आउट यू हैव टू पुट इट बैक एंड देन प्लेस अ बैरियर सो दैट इट डज नॉट कम आउट अगेन राइट नाउ वी आर डूइंग दैट हर्नियोप्लास्टी सम some students uh, have marked the answer as herniotomy beta uh, herniotomy so let me tell you here itself that what is actually the concept of herniotomy if suppose this is the anterior superior iliac spine this is the pubic tubercle this is the pubic symphysis area and if i say beta g ki this here this is the inguinal canal suppose this is the inguinal canal here now Congenital hernias basically during intrauterine life there is extension of the peritoneum the process is vaginalis which goes down right up to the scrotum right generally what happens beta this process is vaginalis this gets completely obliterated before birth so if this is obliterated before birth that means here the story after birth generally is like this the story after birth is generally like this so nothing from the peritoneal cavity can go into the scrotum but by chance beta if suppose this green colored extension of peritoneum does not obliterate even after birth then even after birth the communication of the peritoneal cavity persists with the scrotum and whatever is there in the peritoneal cavity that can come through this connection into the bottom of the scrotum if fluid comes from the peritoneal cavity into the scrotum this is a congenital hydrocele if any abdominal content whether it's omentum or intestine comes through this connection into the scrotum then it is a congenital hernia this connection can close spontaneously up to three years of age so up to three years congenital hernias or hydrocele do not require any treatment but if it persists even after three years then what you do is you just open the inguinal canal and put this connection back into the peritoneal cavity and that is what is called as herniotomy so for congenital hernias or congenital hydrocele the treatment is herniotomy but here he is a young male or an adult so in adult the reason is not persistence of this process is vaginalis that is why in adults we are doing a hernioplasty right right beta so here the answer would be hernioplasty okay next question in which type of pelvis the chances of hernia is more common so beta shorter and wider pelvis jitni pelvis choti hogi aur chaudi hogi 
उतने ही जो डिफेक्ट्स हैं वो बड़े होंगे जैसे डीप इन्वाइनल रिंग डिफेक्ट वुड बी वाइडर तो द चांसेस ऑफ हर्निया विल बी मोर सो द रिस्क ऑफ हर्नियशन विल बी मोर इन शॉर्टर एंड वाइडर पेल्बेस एंड दिस इज मैं इन बेली एंड लव एज वेल now these type of questions definitely i would say beta this looks to be a very small type very small question but generally when we are reading or when uh, in the classes also uh, we do not focus on this type of pelvis what should be the type of pelvis for this herniation so definitely these i would say are trickier questions and difficult to answer unless and until we know the reason we have read about this right okay fine now this i hope majority of you have marked the answer correct a patient presented in the opd with serious and pus discharge from the opening in the perianal region diagnosed as fistula in ano gold standard investigation for fistula in ano yes beta it is mri and i was really impressed that many of you told me that yes when we talk about the pelvic area then we talk about mris in fistula especially beta we want to know the relation of the fistula tract with the sphincter muscles because we want to know the sphincter muscle status in relation to the fistula mri gives us the best diagnosis right that is why the answer for this would be mri very good beta dili basse topendra ramesh bismin deep sudhanshu satish bahut badhiya beta uh, inshallah ishwar kare beta कि आ, आ, आप सब लोग जो आप लोगों ने इतनी मेहनत की है मे गॉड बी काइंड इनफ एंड मेक एवरी वन ऑफ यू टू पास एंड वी ऑल नो बेटा एग्जाम सर ओवर राइट बट बिकॉज यू हैव बीन अ पार्ट ऑफ दिस प्रोसेस अ लॉन्ग जर्नी यू हैव बीन रियली वर्किंग वेरी वेरी हार्ड many a times uh, we really feel low when we see that we have worked so hard and we are facing the series of uh, questions which we have actually not heard of we know that yes there were previous year questions as well paper 1 had a uh, more number of previous year questions paper 2 had less number of uh, previous year questions uh, but still i would say that 40% of the questions as far as surgery is concerned were easily doable right there was a catch related to uh, other questions in surgery which i think would be getting covered from uh, other areas right yes let me be honest about it uh, another question now onco surgery this took a greater uh, part of surgery this time a patient who is a chronic tobacco chewer for more than 20 years presented to the opd with a thick white patch on the lateral border of the tongue for the last 7 uh, months what are the next line of management in this patient so basically thick white patch he is talking about that means should be a leukoplakia and uh, we know that uh, leukoplakia though we consider it as pre malignant lesion uh, but we need to actually make a diagnosis and know what is the actual stage of uh, the, the dysplastic changes are there or not uh, so biopsy is important to make the diagnosis definitely yes we'll ask him to stop tobacco use wait and watch but we want to make the correct diagnosis of this so we can just uh, do a local excision do a biopsy and then uh, we can advise the patient if it turns out to be a benign lesion we just go ahead with the follow ups uh, every 6 months with the advice to stop tobacco use wait and watch so the first thing to be done here is this and if it turns out to be non malignant then we'll just keep on advising about this otherwise we'll go with the definitive treatment maybe uh, a carbon dioxide laser or uh, maybe uh, the surgical excision for those uh, lesions right so the correct answer would be take a biopsy from this white patch wonderful i'm got navin satish rajiv archana megha aryan i'm got very good beta god bless you god bless all of you beta and just pray to god that all of you come out with flying colors another question beta now this uh, i am not pretty sure this was asked in the exam or not but uh, just after the exam i received this question from one of the student so uh, uh, if it was there and they were asking that uh, which drug we use in the treatment for rectal cancer and the answer for this is oxaliplatin 
if by chance this question was there right so i have a doubt about question number 30 whether it was there in the exam or not now herein this particular question look at the screen carefully better a patient presented with rectal prolapse on clinical examination there was a growth at the anal verge which is diagnosed as squamous cell carcinoma of the anal verge now which of the following is the most adequate treatment in this patient i would like to tell you better that if suppose i say that this is the anal canal and if there is a malignancy which is growing from the anal canal area right the treatment is different but if it is a malignancy which is at the anal verge area then the treatment is different so uh, you have to see whether it was a question where they gave the rectal prolapse story with a cancer at the anal verge if there was a cancer at the anal verge then the answer for this will be wide excision but if they gave that there was a prolapsing mass from the anal canal which uh, presented as a foul smelling growth outside the anal canal and it was found to be squamous cell carcinoma that means he is talking about a carcinoma of the anal canal if it is carcinoma of the anal canal then for these malignancies beta we give negro regime and negro regime is actually a combination of chemo and radiotherapy so if it was carcinoma of the anal canal the answer will be chemo radiation but if it was carcinoma of the anal verge a cauliflower mass and if they mentioned this anal verge in the option anal verge in the question then you have to be careful beta if it was anal verge then the answer was wide excision but if it was not anal verge homosexual cauliflower like growth okay right so if there were two questions also Adil one was related to carcinoma anal canal the answer was negro regime chemo radiation if there was another question with cancer cauliflower like growth at the anal verge uh, as squamous cell carcinoma then the answer will be wide excision okay right both uh, whether it's anal canal cancer comes uh, zaman or uh, whether it is uh, anal verge both will be squamous cell carcinomas right now there was another question uh, where it was which of the following is not true about nephroblastoma uh, spread by lymphatics uh, nephroblastoma can spread by all three routes local lymphatic and blood but most often they spread through hematogenous route so early lung metastasis are there in nephroblastomas treatment is chemotherapy followed by surgery yes for stage one stage two nephroblastoma we give chemo and do surgery for stage three and four all three modalities chemo surgery and radio is done uh, the fourth option was it is the commonest intra-abdominal malignancy in children it is the second most common malignancy intra-abdominal malignancy in children the most common is neuroblastoma so if this was the question uh, then the answer would be uh, D. Uh, let me just check beta Saj is saying that anal verge was not mentioned okay beta if anal verge was not there anal canal prolapsing mass um, with foul smelling cauliflower like growth then it is C anal canal and the answer would be chemo radio and Sajid is also suggesting that stone was a stew white stone okay right converse if uh, verge was not there then we'll go ahead with the chemo radio Now another question, a uh, 55 year old lady presented with painless hematuria and swelling in the left flank. On examination of 4 cm bellotable mass was felt in the left flank region. Urine cytology positive for malignant cells, next line of treatment in this patient. So he is basically talking about uh, a malignancy in the kidney which is around 4 cm. Right. So if the tumor is uh, uh, 4 cm then uh, in the kidney then we are doing a partial nephrectomy. Uh, so, uh, if you have to do a partial nephrectomy, that is we can call it nephron sparing surgery as well. We have to dissect through the different layers and then try to preserve the uh, majority of the nephrons and just remove the tumor along with the adequate margin in the kidney. So, surgery will be the answer for a 4 centimeter kidney cancer. 
not chemo, not intravesical BCG. In surgery, we have two options. One is a partial, another is a radical nephrectomy. So, for a 4 cm, we will go ahead with a partial nephrectomy. Okay. So, Sajid, uh, can you, uh, very good, beta, if uh, it was a true white stone, was it, was it stone too big in size? Uh, if it was more than 1.5 cm looking like that, then we would have done a PCNL. There. Okay. Another question, which of the following is a preferred treatment for muscle invasive bladder cancer? So, beta, for bladder cancers, what we know about is, if suppose I say that this is a urinary bladder and this is the urethra here, the innermost layer, uh, this is suppose the mucosa here, then just behind the mucosa is the submucosal layer and then there is a muscle layer. The bulky layer is the muscle layer, the brown brown color. So if suppose it is not a muscle invasive tumor, if I say that there is a tumor which is just involving the mucosa or the submucosa, then the treatment for these situations is we do a transurethral resection of the bladder tumor, right? But if suppose it is a muscle invasive bladder cancer, if it is a muscle invasive bladder cancer, these are generally solid tumors and for that we need to do a radical cystectomy. And when we are doing a radical cystectomy, we can even include the prostate with it. So, we call it as a cystoprostatectomy also, radical cystectomy. And after doing a radical cystectomy, we have to do a urinary diversion. So, muscle invasive bladder cancer, the treatment is cystoprostatectomy. However, if we go into further details, beta, there are a lot of things uh, which can be done and we can challenge this question that before doing a radical cystectomy, we should do a downstaging of the tumor. So, we can use that new adjuvant chemotherapy with mitomycin C. We can use that intravesical BCG, intravesical mitomycin C as well, right? But if we have to use it as a single liner question, then single liner question, non-muscle invasive bladder cancers, the answer is T, you are BT, transurethral resection of bladder tumor. If it is a muscle invasive bladder cancer, the single one liner answer is radical cystectomy. And if we look at the given options, the radical uh, uh, cystectomy, the answer is cystoprostatectomy. Right. Uh, Lakshman Bitta, what was the treatment for patient with BPH has lower urinary tract symptoms? If there were no complications, Lakshman, then in that particular question, we go ahead with the medical treatment and medical treatment of choice there is stem cellulosin. Okay, Kamru Samvek was in the option, yes. So, uh, that is what, uh, according to the guidelines uh, uh, for muscle invasive bladder cancers, we are doing a radical cystectomy and the only answer uh, out of the given options was cystoprostatectomy for that. Okay. Now, 60 year old male is diagnosed with testicular cancer, which of the following is true about the spread of testicular cancer. Uh, testicular malignancies, we know they spread to the pre and parietic lymph nodes. We know that testicular artery is a direct branch of abdominal aorta. And uh, uh, the concept what we needed here was ki, uh, which lymph node is involved in which cancer. So, we just know that we have to just hold on to the vein of that particular area. And then we have to see where that vein is actually going. Uh, or uh, you can say what is the actual supply of that particular organ, right? And uh, lymph node involved in a particular cancer are according to that uh, vascular uh, supply or drainage of that particular area. Like for all the head and neck malignancies, you know beta, it is the cervical lymph nodes. For all these malignancies, it is the axillary lymph nodes. For the breast, it is the axillary lymph nodes. For the esophagus, the regional lymph nodes. For the stomach, the perigastric. And the principal is the celiac lymph node. Foregut, midgut, hindgut malignancies. Foregut principal lymph node celiac. Midgut principal lymph node superior mesenteric. Hindgut principal lymph node inferior mesenteric. And now in the lower limbs, generally it is the inguinal lymph nodes. Scrotal malignancy, the inguinal lymph nodes. But testis. Testicular supply, testicular artery is a direct branch of abdominal aorta. So, yes, the pre lymph nodes, they are going to be involved there. 
right? The left-sided uh, testicular cancer goes more to the parietic lymph nodes and the right-sided testicular cancer goes to the uh, inter lymph nodes, right? Uh, deep inguinal lymph nodes agar option mein tha bita, uh, if it was deep inguinal, agar yaha pe deep bhi kar dete hain bita, to ye dhyan rakhna ki ye jo deep inguinal lymph nodes ki baat karenge, this would be the perineal area, the skin, the scrotum, that would be going towards the inguinal lymph nodes. But testis which is inside, that is going towards the pre and periotic lymph nodes, right. So the answer for this question was periotic lymph node, okay. Now, PUD orange appearance in breast cancer is due to blockade of which of the following? Uh, again, I would say, Bita, that uh, this question, uh, just at the first look, it might appear very simple, very easy, because this is something which has been asked a number of times, and we all have been studying about this uh, number of times. But what the examiners have done in this particular exam, as far as surgery is concerned, they did not try to create the options as very simple. Right, like we know that PUD orange, PUD orange is due to blockade of subdermal lymphatics by the cancer cells. PUD orange means that the skin is involved in breast cancer. PUD orange means that the stage of cancer is T4B. Right, this is what we know. Now, the subdermal lymphatics are blocked, whether they belong to the superficial channel or the deep channel. That is a question. If you go into more details then the actual reason for PUD orange beta when the breast cancer goes into the axillary lymph nodes and the axillary lymph nodes are studded with cancer then what happens even the skin of the breast is not able to drain those cancer cells towards the axillary lymph nodes so the subdermal lymphatics get blocked and that gives that PUD orange appearance of the skin right that means if somebody wants to go in a little detail and challenge this question then PUD orange is generally because when those deep lymph nodes are getting blocked then the superficial skin is not able to drain but if we don't go into those details and try to remain a little superficial then we should be able to see this this distribution of the lymphatic channels the epidermis the dermis there are lymph capillaries in the epidermis and dermis area. There are pre-collectors. And then in the subcutaneous tissue beta, there are superficial lymph collecting vessels. So basically in PUD orange, what is happening? Subdermal blockade. So this is the subdermal area. That is the subcutaneous tissue area where there are superficial lymph collecting vessels. They get blocked and that gives that PUD orange appearance. And then if we go deep to the deep fascia, there we find the deep lymph collecting vessels, right? Fine. So here, okay, Aman Bita, I, I take that, that they uh, said most commonly presents as abdominal mass. So Wilms tumor definitely will present most commonly as a abdominal mass. Okay. So here, what, what is going to be the answer? Uh, the answer will be the superficial lymphatic channel, right? There is occlusion whether of the lymphatics or the veins. It is the occlusion of the lymphatics. Now, in the lymphatics, whether it is the superficial or deep, so it is the superficial lymphatic channels. Uh, I feel, Bita, that it is really uh, tough to know that what is actually the distribution of the superficial lymph collecting vessels and the deep lymph collecting vessels. But many of you have marked this answer right because you knew that it is due to blockade of the lymphatics. And in the keywords, what we have written, it is the subdermal. So the thought which would have come to your mind is subdermal. Just beneath the dermis, it should be superficial. So many of you would have marked the answer correct, but it was not a cakewalk question. Let me tell you this. Okay. If we go into the details and this question can even be challenged. Fine. Now there was another question, a uh, lady presented with a 2 cm mass lesion with mobile axillary lymph node as shown in the image. Systemic investigation did not reveal involvement of any other organ with cancer. So uh, it was not the exact image like this, <coughs> but something like this, there was little more fungation here. So this is a cancer 
which is infiltrating into the skin. That is what we can make out. Let the tumor be of any size. Generally, when we study the breast cancer staging beta, all of you, what you know is less than two, two to five, more than five, any size, chest wall, skin, both inflammatory. Less than two, two to five, more than five, any size, chest wall, skin, both inflammatory. So here the catch was he has given two centimeter in the question so that he's trying to take you towards T2 or T1. But if it is going into the skin, it may be of any size, it is T4B. This is one thing. The second here thing was mobile axillary lymph nodes. So again, beta in the staging of this cancer, mobile, fixed, right? Mobile axillary, fixed axillary, internal memory. Then this uh, apical plus axillary, axillary plus internal memory and supraclavicular. So this is the lymph node staging. So, mobile axillary is N1. So, it is T4B N1. Now, metastasis were not found. So, if there are no metastasis, it is M0, right? Now, C term is used for that clinical staging, right? C, uh, P can be used for the clinical pathological staging. Why? When we have done the investigations and we come to know about that. M0 means no evidence of metastasis, MX when we don't know about the status of metastasis, right? So we have to just find it, find out what is this, is this available in the options or not? So yes, T4B is there, N1 is there and M0 is there. So the answer for this, okay, only one option has T4B, okay, great. Okay. So what I will do is, uh, uh, I could see some APR option there, Dr. Live. If APR option was there in that CA anal canal question, then CA anal canal, the first treatment of the treatment of choice is chemo radio. If the tumor persists even after giving chemo radio, then we do APR for anal canal cancers. Right? Okay. Fine. Now, another question, the last question from Oncosurgery, genetic testing for BRCA1, BRCA2 gene is indicated in all except. So, genetic testing for this uh, breast cancer, BRCA1, BRCA2 is done if the cancer is diagnosed in early age, especially if we talk about less than 50 years. For male breast cancers, breast plus ovarian cancers, this is the indication for doing the BRCA gene testing. Male breast cancer, yes, we do it. Bilateral breast cancer, yes. Breast cancer diagnosed in a postmenopausal female more than 50 years of age, there is no point in doing that uh, gene testing. So, the correct answer for this is a postmenopausal. Okay, beta, in acute mastitis, the fourth option was fibroadenosis. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Right, Sudanshu, very good. Okay, now there was a question related to the staplers. Uh, this what you are seeing, this is a linear stapler. Uh, there are circular staplers which are circular in shape, curvy linear which are curved and then there is a linear thing. Uh, so the correct answer for this question was a linear stapler. Okay. Another question, patient was recently operated where laparotomy was done, patient developed a complication after the operation, what would be the surest sign of wound dehiscence in this uh, patient? Uh, this may be a wrongly framed question here uh, because I did not get too many uh, reviews for this question, okay? Uh, so if this was a framing of a uh, question, severe abdominal pain, zero sanguinous discharge, hypertension of bleeding, the answer for uh, bust abdomen or wound dehiscence after laparotomy, it's a pinkish uh, sanguinous discharge coming out from the wound, generally on 6th or 7th post-operative day. And the last of the questions, there was an image-based question which looked like a phoneus gangrene. Phoneus gangrene is actually a mixed infection, polymicrobial, uh, both aerobic, anaerob, anaerob, these are involved. It is like necrotizing fasciitis, which includes the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, but not the deeper tissues. So, testes are preserved in phoneus gangrene. 
we have to do a radical debridement we have to remove all the skin and everything and many a times we just leave the two testes uh, with the patient when we have removed the entire scrotal skin right so uh, basically the treatment is not just to provide the scrotal support better we have to do a radical excision of the skin subcutaneous tissue with aggressive antibiotics it is not only caused by streptococcus it is a mixed infection treatment is to wait and watch no testes are preserved yes this is a characteristic feature of fourniers gangrene where the testes are preserved right so for this the answer is d right beta so uh, these were the few uh, surgery recalls which i was able to do now you can just uh, uh, relax yourself uh, i'm pretty sure that many of you would have been able to cross 15 to 16 uh, in these uh, questions what we have discussed and uh, this i feel is pretty good number looking at the toughness of the surgery paper thank you very much thank you for helping me out and thank you to all the students uh, regarding uh, the recalls uh, i have i'm really thankful from the bottom of my of my heart to all those students and beta you have done your job you have done a lot of hard work हमारे बस में सिर्फ मेहनत करना है हमने ईमानदारी से अपनी पूरी शिद्दत के साथ पूरे दिल से बहुत मेहनत की बहुत मेहनत की पेपर वन बहुत अच्छे से हमने किया भी है वो कॉन्फिडेंस हमारे अंदर है पेपर टू चूंकि थोड़ा बाद में हुआ पेपर वन के तो वो जो हम कॉन्फिडेंस कैरी कर रहे थे पेपर वन का पेपर टू में हमें वो कॉन्फिडेंस लेवल्स नहीं मिल पाए हमारा कॉन्फिडेंस पेपर टू देख के थोड़ा शेक हुआ डेफिनेटली वी डू अंडरस्टैंड बट डिस्पाइट दिस अगर अपने को पूरा 300 क्वेश्चन देखना है तो 300 क्वेश्चन में देर आर मोर नंबर ऑफ चांसेस कि यू वुड हैव मार्क दो आंसर्स करेक्ट क्लिनिकल क्वेश्चन में स्पेशली the knowledge which you which you have learned na that concept which you have developed inside you that would have helped you in marking the correct answers and also i would like to tell you one thing here beta there are some students who see these recalls and try to make their answers according to the recalls ki what is going to be their score as per the recalls my strong recommendation is all these recalls which are done by so many respected faculties who put so much of efforts to come out with the questions to help you out uh, still i would say beta that in these recalls in the framing of the question even if there is a change of one word or two words the answer will change accordingly so whatever you are seeing in the recalls is based on the framing of the question done in the recall which may not be the exact framing done in the real exam right there might be various twist in the exam so whatever knowledge you have had after these classes that knowledge would have helped you in answering the right answers in the exam take my words let's see the results just relax now just pray to god that god we have done really hard work may our hard work be rewarded and may all of us crack this exam like anything thank you very much thank you so so very much from the bottom of my heart and uh, may god bless you all beta and uh, we all at mist pray to god that all of you come out with flying colors signing off this is dr vinith gupta your surgery faculty if i would have committed any mistakes or anything please forgive me and please do send me a message on whatsapp so that i can correct myself in future thank you very much god bless you bye bye